Uh, welcome uh, to the Resilience Hub and our event uh, one year later, implementing the evidence roadmap on climate and disaster risk finance and insurance using innovative solutions. So uh, we're going to be having uh, a series of, I would say, mini, mini TED Talk style uh, uh, interventions from our expert panelists uh, and then some rapid fire questions, uh, Q&A, um, but also we'll be opening up to the audience as well. So please be ready with any questions you may have. So uh, climate and disaster risk financing and insurance solutions are fairly new to the international stage. Um, many countries, businesses and families are actually uh, uh, showing interest in the need for these types of instruments to uh, help mitigate some of the extreme impacts of uh, weather events. Um, now the evidence roadmap is, as it sounds, a roadmap that sets out the uh, key research questions that are needed to scale CDF, uh, CDRFI solutions, and most importantly, to improve their reach and impact. And uh, helps uh, aims to increase the research uh, evidence base for these types of solutions. Um, I think, you know, before I hand over to my uh, first panelist, who will be talking a little bit about the roadmap, um, I just want to highlight uh, how important this agenda clearly is, and we're seeing very much here in the first opening days of the uh, of COP27 from. Uh, uh, world leaders um, and, and the UN Secretary General, the importance of urgently scaling up finance for adaptation, but also the really uh, challenging issue around uh, loss and damage. And so uh, I think you know, this could not be timelier, um, and it's really uh, great that this uh, roadmap is uh, being presented here, and of course much further work will continue. So I'm going to hand over to Sonke Kreft, who is the Executive Director of the Munich Climate Insurance Initiative, who will talk us through uh, the roadmap. Super. Um, thank you for the nice welcome. I got told that we have a very nice infographic. In ah, there it is. Perfect. Okay. Um, so my role is to um, quickly set the scene um, and um, introduce to you the evidence roadmap, which has, was actually launched one year ago at the Resilience Hub in Glasgow. Um, so ha have the theme of consistency here to some extent. Um, and I'm not sure if everyone knows about the evidence roadmap, uh, what it says, um, and why this document was created. Um, so I'm uh, giving you a quick overview. So. Basically, it dates back to uh, about two years ago, there was a big workshop uh, with stakeholders, with um, academic, uh, academic actors. Um, and the thought was, or the observation was, um, yes, there's a lot of momentum in the space of uh, climate and disastrous finance and insurance. Um, programs are scaled up, um, more public funding uh, is entering the space, um, but this kind of um, upscale is not necessarily uh, accompanied by the uh, de right degree of evidence um, at the same time. And um, this is very much needed um, to um, sustainably over time um, actually um, anchor these type of instruments um, as an appropriate solution. So that was, was the basic thought behind it. Um, and um, I also should quickly say um, this is part of the Insurance Global Partnership. Um, a really multi-actor partnership that drives forward this, uh, this topic. There are different working groups under the uh, Insurance Global Partnership. One of the working group is called the Impact Working Group. Um, and by the name, you already can think on what that group is focusing on, uh, namely increasing um, the impact of um, disastrous finance uh, solutions, different activities there. Um, and as part of that group, this evidence theme uh, uh, was um, identified as a strategic topic. Um, and so uh, with the workshop, uh, different actors and authors came together and thought what we actually need is sign some kind of a signposting document, which really guides the community. Um, and it was also quite clear that um, this document cannot be written by one author, but really needs to be a collaborative uh, approached by the entire community. So this is really what it was. So it started with this early workshop 
And then last year, over several months, it was followed by a sequence of workshops. There were like um, individual uh, uh, authors uh, taking responsibilities for part of the of the draft, and then the draft was also then shared uh, uh, among Intrusians uh, members um, to even receive further feedback um, and also give it some official status. So that is the genesis of that document. Um, and I can say it is um, divided in three parts. So one um, part is actually thematically, what are the, the, the knowledge frontiers, um, what are the uh, critical research questions um, that for example, academic actors, um, but also implementers and um, all the stakeholders and uh, disasters, finance and insurance should work on. So this is, this is the first part. Second part was a call uh, to action. So what does it mean uh, in terms of um, evidence norms that each and everyone um, should adhere to, also some kind of specific actions that can be taken and investments that need to happen. Um, and lastly, um, the evidence roadmap also details the specific role of different stakeholders. So it's quite clear science and uh, academia plays a role, but also we like to see implementers um, taking a new approach towards evidence and impact, or the private sector, or civil society. Um, so um, this is uh, more or less how it's structured. Um, just quickly, in terms of the um, thematic setup, um, it identifies overall um, six uh, uh, knowledge frontiers. The framework it was created was to look at kind of quick impacts. What are research questions where we would need to have like a stakeholder taking responsibility for it and also um, um, in a way responding to it, answering it, um, uh, um, moving forward um, the, 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 the information and also the, the general knowledge. A second category is persistent questions. There we're talking about optimization questions. If I can take, for example, insurance, one question is on parametric insurance is about basic uh, basis risk. Um, that's uh, a question that's never going to go away, uh, but we can get better in it. And these are this kind of persistent research questions. And then the last category uh, is um, transformational evidence. Um, and um, as an author group, we defined this where we really have to bring in different disciplinary, uh, disciplinary backgrounds, different actors working together on research questions to be able to, uh, to respond to it. Um, these kind of um, research questions, as I said, are clustered in six, uh, uh, along six knowledge uh, frontiers, and you can see them here on the screen, starting with like the, the people, community, and client uh, focus perspective, looking at the national level, public sector, um, global risk finance action, so um, global level and the meta level, but then also specifically looking, for example, at the gender dimension, looking at risk information and analysis, um, and looking at resilience outcomes. Um, so the question around climate resilience specifically. I don't have the time to go through all the research questions, <laughs> obviously. I think in total we identified around 56 or something like that. Um, but uh, I encourage you um, to go on the Intrusions website. Yesterday they launched this nice infographic, which uh, uh, you can, can all access, um, and, and that can be a, a point of contact. And I really like to see also coming out of the discussions how individual, for example, research actors reacted to these research questions and if there's anything already to report on where we actually made progress since last year. Um, in concluding, um, I also said there are like, uh, two other areas. Uh, one is the call to action. Um, and the call to action basically uh, looks at uh, establishing general norms for evidence that everyone needs to do. For example, we need to enforce an open data approach. Um, or we need to uh, truly commit uh, to, um, uh, to, to, to program uh, impact and evidence as part of the implementation activity. Say 5% of the uh, um, implementation needs to go to, to monitoring or to evidence in general. Um, we are also talking about concrete evidence actions. So for example, we identified that often there's a, a barrier in terms of language. Um, so um, um, some kind of language, uh, a common uh, language um, terminology. Um, but also uh, specifically enhancing academic outreach. We are often talking about silos. Um, there's a complaint that uh, academia acts in an ivory tower. 
um, and the need to uh, encourage triangular uh, or evidence corporations and especially triangular evidence corporations, for example, between also uh, specific Southern, Southern actors uh, in the space. And the last one really being on the evidence investment. So uh, putting, putting money into the space, um, launching, um, for example, research funding calls. Um, I also like to see uh, what happened there uh, and what comes next, um, but also convening the evidence actors um, uh, in, in this space. So um, that's about it. Um, I hope the evidence roadmap um, is a meaningful document to the different um, actors um, that, for example, private sector uses um, evidence as part of its product development, um, that civil society organizations commit to an evidence-based uh, advocacy approach, for example, um, and that, of course, uh, for example, uh, funders, uh, donors, and implementers are also using evidence in, in using uh, public resources. So in the end, we need um, effective uh, disbursement of resources, just as, a, as an idea on how, how different uh, actor groups can take it up. So this is basically the setup, and uh, happy to have any questions on the evidence roadmap, and looking forward to the discussions. Great, thank you. <clears throat> and I'm sure we'll uh, follow up uh, with lots of questions. Um, so I think you know, a key part of this, it has been the, uh, obviously the learning, learning from the evidence, uh, and understand that uh, uh, the German Development Evaluation Institute, uh, DEVAL, if, if that's how you say it, <laughs> yes, <laughs> DEVAL, um, has specifically been uh, uh, looking at uh, the experiences through the road trip um, and uh, looking at uh, how international development cooperation in particular can help um, uh, deploy this evidence. So uh, I'm delighted that Alexandra uh, Kungitter Kun Kun um, is uh, here to tell us a bit about that. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. And um, yeah, I would like to share with you a little bit our is the microphone working. Yeah, our um, experiences, our rocky road to evidence, and then come to um, the call for um, further evidence generation and um, uh, distribution. So, uh, as we hear here, more ambition um, is important, but as we also hear in Egypt over and over again, there's really the urgent need for action, for implementation. And I think we as evidence providers have the role um, to trans translate action in impactful action by providing the basis for learning, but also for ho holding donors accountable um, for their commitments and, and intervention. And um, against um, this um, background, I would like to share, DEVAL is an independent institute, uh, a federal research institute in Bonn, doing strategic evaluations on an overall questions and strategies, not on a program and project level, working also on um, evaluation capacity development and methods and standards for um, evaluation. And to take you on the journey to evidence and share a bit our experiences as a background, when we started with a major evaluation on German ODA for climate change adaptation in 2018, so quite a while um, ago, um, we found that there was um, really a need, a major gap in evidence, um, evaluations remained mainly on a project level and were rather scattered. So, and at the same time, there was a lot of uh, political um, development of um, increasing funding for um, specific interventions, sectors, etc. So, um, a high degree of complexity also when it comes to actors, etc. So, we um, adopted a modular approach um, um, for um, structuring the evaluation, one component and instruments uh, for managing residual climate risks, which is, I think, uh, specifically important. Um, also to the work for the Insurance um, Resilience Global Partnership, which is also already published. And um, when starting um, as a 
As a basis for our work, we joined forces with the Green Climate Fund and their independent evaluation unit and um, first worked on a so-called evidence gap map, which is a very systematic protocol and procedure to, um, to research following um, particular steps um, for already existing uh, evidence and then to cluster it um, according to intervention sector and outcome areas. And um, well, this was a quite resourceful exercise um, going on. You can find the results um, published online also on the 3IE um, um, website. And um, this showed us uh, in, a, in a nutshell where we already have evidence scarce field and evidence rich field. Um, attention, it doesn't say, tell us if um, something about the direction and strength of evidence. It just says that the evidence is there. That the other um, questions require more work on systematic reviews, meta-analysis, etc. So that was a great start, our joint work with the GCF, um, to, to see where to set the work. And um, then we used it, for example, in the next step for intervention heat maps, where we overlaid the GCF's portfolio and German ODA portfolio um, um, with existing evidence to see where we are operating um, in what field. Um, for example, um, yeah, that yeah, how, how evidence clusters um, match with uh, interventions. Um, in a further um, step, we also applied evidence gap maps in, within a macro quantitative study on the portfolio and allocation patterns um, based on OECD CRS data to see drivers of allocation. And um, this gives a perfect overview for setting our and improving continuously our personal evidence roadmap. Um, but however, um, questions remain open, for example, on the effectiveness. Um, do interventions really match uh, um, uh, and are they relevant to and for whom are they relevant? Um, so there's a very um, diversity of um, beneficiaries. So um, just to give you an overview, we applied several case studies in a bunch of uh, partner countries, um, made um, experimental designs like discrete choice experiments and um, flood modelings, other um, data collection processes to fill step by step the evidence gaps. So um, this very in brief um, to, to take you a little bit on our journey um, to the road to, to evidence and um, where well, you can find all our evaluation reports also in English available on the website of DIVAL um, and I'm also happy to address more questions but uh, on future evidence activities and since we found that evidence still matters a lot. I would like to point out um, that there's, for example, also um, a funding program from DIVAL to, um, to stronger anchor um, rigorous evidence and development cooperation. So this um, will start in spring 2023 and run for several years, for four years. Um, and um, work on rigorous evidence generation. You will find more information also on the website. And in addition to this, I would also stress, uh, would like to stress the need um, to contribute to existing evidence initiatives. For example, your open data has already been set. Um, for example, also by the 3IE initiative, um, we also have a database on rigorous impact evaluations where you can browse for information, not only in climate change, but also on other topics relevant to the Agenda 2030. And um, you can also share your existing um, evidence. So um, this um, up to now for the call for future evidence generation. Thank you. Thank you. So, I mean, just a quick follow up on that. So uh, could you just say maybe in particularly for any other potential donors, why you think it's important to dedicate specifically funding for, for this research activities? 
Yeah, I mean, I think uh, that independent research and evaluation as a form of uh, applied research is still highly relevant um, to navigate uh, um, development cooperation um, through two um, impactful to effective interventions to learn and be accountable as well. And um, uh, we found um, with our evidence uh, gap map, but also with other exercises, that there is a lot of um, uh, need to generate new evidence, especially when it comes to topics such as climate risk insurances, which is, which are very young in the implementation. So we also needed to adopt a formative uh, perspective, and um, which are evolving very quickly. Yeah. Great, thank you. So probably a lot of evidence that isn't yet being uh, readily shared just yet. So um, I'm going to turn now to Emily Wilkinson, who's a senior research fellow at the Overseas Development Institute, ODI. Uh, you specialize in disaster and climate risk governance and finance, uh, with a particular focus on small island developing states. Um, so Emily, you've also been involved in, uh, in looking at the evidence base here. Can you share some of your findings and thoughts on this? Yeah, thanks very much. So um, ODI has been working on a political economy analysis, a study around the incentives um, and barriers to um, governments using climate disaster risk finance and insurance instruments, but also looking um, at the, the donor side and the incentives um, and barriers around donors providing subsidies. Um, so really fascinating study, and I think some, some sort of initial findings that you will hopefully find interesting. So we looked at particularly the, um, the regional risk pools, um, and, and so we looked at um, ARC, um, uh, CRIF, and PCRIC in the Pacific. So generally, um, on the government, developing country government side, um, one of the sort of key findings is that decisions countries make about whether or not to take out these insurance policies um, is, um, involves a multitude of actors. It's not a kind of single decision taken just by sort of one person in the finance ministry. There's lots and lots of different um, uh, stakeholders involved with different incentives and perspectives and skill sets, all of which can impact on the uptake of insurance. That's the first point. The second is um, that country-specific situations make a difference. Um, and for example, if there's an upcoming election or a new uh, minister of finance or um, you know, a, a, a really big impact disaster, all of these things will have uh, an effect on whether or not countries decide um, to take out insurance policies. Maybe none of that is particularly surprising. Um, we also looked at and we, we sort of polled um, the, uh, all of the interviewees that we spoke to about the most um, important factors I influencing sovereign risk insurance uptake. And I'll just list some of them roughly in order of how important they felt they were. First was affordability of premiums and fiscal space. Second, understanding and technical capacity, um, the technical capacity to sort of work out whether insurance was, you know, how it would work and what it meant. Third, availability of alternatives. Fourth, perceptions of reliability. Fifth, re relevance of products. Um, and then there are a few other factors after that. So you can sort of see the affordability question obviously being right up there, um, as well as, you know, affordability relative to fiscal space, particularly important. I think, you know, because we spoke to a lot of uh, governments in the Caribbean and Pacific, that was a particular issue um, affecting their, you know, their, their sort of um, appetite for um, spending money on insurance premiums uh, every year. Um, we also, um, it, uh, uh, another one of the other findings that I think was interesting is that all the regional risk pools that we looked at have used um, premium subsidies as a way to grow 
their membership. So it's a real kind of pull factor for them. And they obviously want to grow their membership because the more members they have, um, you know, the, the, uh, the better the, 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 the risk pool works really in, in terms of being able to spread risk. Um, so um, yeah, ARC in particular has seen kind of business levels grow um, the more the subsidies that have been uh, provided. And then fi final point on the sort of government side, um, our analysis also finds that it's not, um, affordability is not the only factor that's important. And there have been examples where even with premium subsidies being offered um, at 100% in the case of Mozambique, um, the, that's not been a sufficient incentive for a country to join a risk pool. So there are other really important aspects to do with the quality of the product, the capacity of countries, and the kind of country and regional dynamics, um, you know, which influence those decisions. So I think, you know, all of that important to take into account. And then if I might just say a few things about um, donor decisions, because, you know, this is just as important, really. Um, and I don't think um, it's, it's, it's harder to study. It's all a bit murky, I would say. <laughs> um, the first thing that we found in terms of like factors that um, donors have been using in allocating and designing subsidies, um, the first thing we found is that subsidy allocation is really, really complex and that donors use different criteria, have used different criteria um, to, and supporting different kind of objectives for the risk pools. Um, and they often work through intermediaries such as the African Development Bank. So it's sort of part, partially the sort of donor criteria and then partially related to um, the, the intermediary and their um, allocation criteria. Um, the main donors that are providing premium subsidies do like, have criteria. Um, I mean, the most obvious one being um, eligibility for official development assistance. Um, there's also, they, they, can't offer they can't offer subsidies to um, countries that are directly under sanctions. Um, so that's... Um, prohibited some um, African countries from uh, joining ARC. Um, donors have a, a longer list of preference though for allocating subsidies and it, it was quite difficult to kind of work through what they were. Um, um, particularly, um, uh, that, that, I mean the things that they, they were particularly, seem to be particularly interested in um, is that, like having a plausible exit strategy, which I thought was interesting. Um, so, you know, if, um, keen on providing subsidies, allocating those um, according to their sort of own criteria, but very much with a view to not providing those subsidies indefinitely. Um, they tend to be provided for um, new countries or new products. So if you're already in the scheme, you're not going to get a subsidy, which I thought was interesting as well. Um, and obviously there are priority countries for every donor, and there needs to be a, a demand demonstrable need. So um, overall, factors that they are really sort of considered the most important for allocating and designing these premium capital uh, support and subsidies, um, you know, around like proportion of vulnerable population um, in the total population, high levels of risk and so on. Um, they, these seem to be like, you know, cl close to what we could sort of understand as being the main kind of criteria for which countries get a subsidy and which don't, um, as well as, you know, they're obviously interested in value for money and cost effectiveness. Um, and finally, I'm nearly finished, <laughs> um, we identified a number of um, areas for kind of improvement in the allocation and design of premium capital support um, and subsidies. Um, firstly, um, we heard very clearly in, from the stakeholders that donor decisions um, in many cases need to better acknowledge and reflect country perspectives and decision-making processes. So that it doesn't seem that, that those sort of things were being taken into account, that by the criteria and the selection coming from sort of very sort of donor-driven. Um, countries are often not getting clear information um, early on in their policy development as to whether or not they'll, and, the, and when they're negotiating the premium, as to whether or not they're definitely going to be able to abs access a subsidy or not, which makes it really difficult for them to decide whether or not that's something they want to go, go in for. Um, and, I, you know, I think overall this, there's definitely need for further consultation and clarity around donors' objectives um, in providing subsidies um, because there doesn't seem to be an, a 
consensus around the appropriate size or duration of premium subsidies. So those are the kind of overarching findings from the study. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, and maybe, maybe you'll come back in a bit and ask, you know, are there any, you're seeing any gaps in the research actually, and maybe some recommendations of further research in this area. Um, but before that, we'll hand over now to uh, Dr. Harold Herbam, who is the Deputy Director at the SOAS uh, Center for Sustainable Finance. So, uh, Harold, uh, please maybe provide a bit more perspective from particularly the public sector. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you also to uh, GIZ for, for inviting us um, to, this, uh, to this panel. Uh, I wanted to speak very briefly about uh, some of the work we're currently doing with the Resilience and Adaptation Mainstreaming Program, uh, short ramp. I thought that was quite a nice acronym um, to, uh, uh, to help build a capacity to uh, gather, understand, use evidence in these spaces uh, at both the level of ministries, central ministries, finance, economics, planning, and universities in vulnerable developing uh, countries. So RAMP, um, the Secretariat for RAMP is um, based at WRI in, in the US, the World Resources Institute, and it consists of two pillars. One is the engagement with those central ministries in our partner countries, and the other and that's um, the one I'm responsible for, together with my uh, colleague um, Uli Voltz at, uh, at SOAS, is the engagement with uh, leading universities in those partner countries. That's across Africa, uh, Asia, the Caribbean, uh, whereas the ministerial engagement focuses at the moment at Sub-Saharan Africa, mainly. And so what we find with our engagement is that uh, um, the capacity to do so, to understand this information as evidence, to, to gather it, to then use it, decision useful approaches is lacking uh, at ministerial level, it's lacking at the university level uh, and so we're coming in uh, through um, on the university side uh, building curricula with our partners uh, uh, university um, in uh, Kenya, Uganda uh, uh, Ghana um, Bangladesh, actually ICAT is uh, one of our partners um, and their um, co-host for this or the uh, managing partners uh, for the Resilience uh, Hub, um, Vietnam, uh, Jamaica for the University of the West Indies, um, for some of those core modules and core understandings on adaptation finance, on disaster risk finance, on understanding climate-related macrofinancial risk, on climate budgeting, because our belief is that by strengthening this capacity at university level, we're not only helping educate a future generation of leaders and those who are going to be dealing with these issues in the years to come, but also because universities engage very directly with, with uh, government, with government ministries, they help train, they help build knowledge, they help build understanding. So these two arms, ministerial engagement and engagement with universities, really go hand in hand. And we've developed a number of uh, core modules already in co-creation approaches uh, that we're working on together with our partners because we really want our university partners to take the lead in this. This is um, us as a hosting at SOAS University of London, the, the secretariat for the university network for strengthening macrofinancial resilience to climate and environmental change. It's a very long, very long name. We don't have a good acronym for that. Uh, but we want our partners to say, we now have this understanding, this capacity. We're going to develop this for ourselves and for the rest of the growing network um, so that uh, it becomes self-sustaining and it becomes something a lot more powerful and effective over the long run so that we uh, we don't just you know go in and uh, do something for a year or two but we are going to look at this as a generational approach uh, really uh, so this is what what we've been doing for the last uh, year and a half two years um, we have a network now of nine partners from the university side but uh, the goal is to of course, include all the vulnerable developing uh, countries uh, over, the next, uh, over the next several years and to also continue that work at ministerial level. Um, I'm going to leave it at that as, a, as an initial introduction, but uh, any other questions, happy to feel it later. Thank you. Great. I think let's uh, move over to Vasita, uh, who you're uh, from Sly the Slycan Trust, but also uh, representing the Sri Lankan government and working with the Sri Lankan government 
on these issues. So um, it'd be great to hear from you how you're seeing this from your perspective in terms of you know, how this is working in your context. Um, apologies in advance if um, I was a bit, the level of energy is a bit low at the moment after running around. Uh, so um, just an introduction, I work for Slack and Trust as the Executive Director. Uh, Slack and Trust is a non-profit think tank. Uh, we evolved from a civil society to become a think tank, but we continue as a civil society organization. Um, and I also negotiate for the government of Sri Lanka on issues related to adaptation and loss and damage. Um, but I'll be talking in my personal loss like and trust capacity. Um, there would not be any conflicts on what the government would say and I would say, but I would like to be recognized as such uh, in this panel. Um, building on a few things that uh, some of the speakers said, so there would be a correlation of what we've been speaking. I, I, I think I'll start with um, what Song Kim mentioned about the evidence roadmap and how civil society has been involved in this. Um, so under Institute Resilience um, um, Global Partnership, the civil society members are quite active and I do co-chair, um, or I, I'm a representative for the high-level consultative group of this and I co-chair the evidence um, impact working group with Sonke that was um, working on the evidence roadmap. And there, there was inclusion of the civil society input into the roadmap as well as the inclusive and participatory processes uh, that need to relate on impact assessments and evidence that feed into policy processes and also the projects that are being implemented. Um, so it's important that all actors are involved. Um, I think, um, I'm not sure whether there's private sector here, but also the inclusion of private sector with links to the public sector as well as civil society, as well as the vulnerable communities on the ground. Um, and this comes back to one of the projects that was mentioned, which is about the multi-actor partnership project, where multiple actors are involved in CDRFI processes and building resilience. Um, one example from Sri Lanka where I work, um, we have 70 partners at the moment, and I think at least 50% of these partners are ministries and government entities. And there's active interest to engage in evidence generation that could feed into policy processes. And it's interesting also that sometimes civil society activities, evidence generation could contribute to identifying solutions that have not been documented so far. Um, so for example, again, I go back to Sri Lanka as a first example. Um, Sri Lanka has a crop insurance scheme that's been there for the last 70 years, which was established in 1958. Um, but if you look at this um, and try to find information and research on this, you would find most of it that's done by Slack and Trust or very recently done um, information or evidence um, so this, this is a big gap um, in a lot of developing countries. Th while there are solutions, has this been converted into evidence that could feed into solutions that could be implemented in a manner that's practical? So that's where that whole connection of multiple actors, finding solutions, identifying their role, and then feeding into solutions and mechanisms and processes play a key role. Um, if I bring this all into the negotiating process, um, Interesting ledgers came out of a GST uh, loss and damage discussion where they were also talking about collective action, evidence, how it can feed into tools and methodologies that could contribute to global stock take, in turn bringing into the finance aspect of it the needs to address loss and damage. Um, so I come to the points that I wrote down, which I hardly can read, but hopefully I will be able to. First one is about addressing finance and loss and damage. Um, I think in this in this sphere of um, financial loss and damage means of implementation. Uh, civil society has played a big role with other actors involved. And, um, and I think the civil society has also evolved from advocacy, which is based on a message, which might be the overarching message, to a message that's generated through evidence. But that does not necessarily mean that there are no gaps. So this comes from parties as well as other actors, that there is a big need to generate evidence as well as feed that evidence into processes that could be replicated and implemented. Um, so for Slyke and Trust, coming to that southern perspective and how these connect to the processes that are global, um, so from our end, we are trying to ensure that the voices of the developing countries are represented. And at the moment, we have offices that cater to this as well as um, ensuring that evidence is 
accepted and fed into processes. So we have work that's happening in Niger, um, in Asia, then there's also, well, Niger is in Africa, but in Asia in overall, um, and also Ghana, where we work with youth. Um, so when we're looking at civil society, that would mean we're looking at community-based organizations leading the, the evidence collection, informal settlements where youth would lead the way, like in, in Kenya, as um, in one of the settlements we work in. Um, looking at Niger, we have a partnership with government where we are feeding into um, evidence generation that would help um, support policy processes. Um, so it's a constructive process where everyone has a role to play. Civil society's role is actually evolving. I think that image of what a civil society organization 20 years ago and now could be different. And we have also tried to adapt to it. That's where from a youth organization we've converted into a civil society plus a think tank where evidence plays a key role. I'll stop at that and I'll come back a bit later if needed. Thank you. Thank you. And I mean, it's great to have these different perspectives and in particular, I mean, you bring a both government and a civil society perspective and it's interesting how both of your, uh, from academia and CSOs, have a very important role in helping to build the capacity to be able to use this data effectively. I mean, clearly at the national level, we've had also from a development funding, funded donor level, uh, and also importantly in the context of these negotiations. So I think now we're going to hear from the private sector, but these uh, our private sector participants are joining virtually. So, um, okay, great. Uh, I, do I need to, I'll just introduce you and then I assume everything's handled over there. So um, we have now um, two uh, members of the private sector who uh, are working in this area. Um, so we have uh, Simon Schwal, uh, co-founder and CEO of OKO, OKO. Um, so an uh, entrepreneur in microinsurance. And uh, we also have Ella, um, who is, uh, uh, I don't have your full name written here, um, Ella, but you've been working in, um, uh, sorry, Maybe, Ella, I'll let you introduce yourself. <laughs> I saw your bio, but didn't say exactly which private sector company you're in. So I'll let you introduce yourself. Thank you. Ella, maybe you go ahead. <laughs> okay, then I go ahead. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Ella. I'm a doctoral researcher at the University of Göttingen. And we collaborate on a research project together with OCO. So OCO is the private sector actor here, and um, I'm from the academia side. Okay. Thank you. So I apologize for the noisy background. I'm in the airport in, uh, in Shamisha. Um, so yeah, I want to give uh, our view as a private sector actor. Uh, just a quick introduction on OCO. OCO brings crop insurance to small farmers in Africa uh, using mobile uh, payment, mobile registration. Uh, so we do both the product design and product distribution. We are active in Mali, Uganda, and Ivory Coast, and we quickly became the largest crop insurer in, uh, in Mali. Now, I'll be uh, very honest. Um, the, um, I cannot say that we use the, uh, the, the evidence framework uh, to orient our work. Our work is uh, very focused on uh, short-term goals to make uh, these index insurance products profitable and uh, useful for our customers. And um, this is, is well, it's great to have a framework to, uh, uh, to know what are the, the big questions to resolve. Um, it's not something that, is, uh, that we use on a day-to-day -day basis to, uh, to make decisions. But uh, what's really important for us is that we collect data on uh, the, the, impact, the positive impact that we have. On one side, because uh, we have um, private investors who are impact-oriented, because we have uh, partners who are uh, from NGOs or development organizations, but also because we need to make sure that we have a positive impact if we want to keep our customers insured and if, uh, if we want to make sure that they see value in being insured. Um, when we need to measure impact, it's very useful to have such a framework. It, uh, it helps us to structure the, uh, the research, but we also uh, don't do this alone. 
we usually partner with um, NGOs or, in this case, also uh, academics with ELA, uh, because on one side we want to remain uh, unbiased, and if we were doing this, uh, this impact research, that would be uh, which would necessarily imply some, uh, some subjectivity. And on the other hand, because we don't have the expertise, so um, I think for us as private sector, uh, to sum up my point of view, the, this, this kind of framework is really helpful to understand what uh, our partners are looking for, uh, what we need to, uh, to provide as evidence to continue getting the support from uh, development organizations, NGOs, impact investors, etc. And on the other hand, it helps us uh, and our partners doing the research to structure the, uh, the evidence um, gathering. And that's, I think, what, where Ella can, uh, can take over and explain what uh, the work we've been doing together. Yeah, thank you, Simon. Uh, so last year we started co to cooperate together with OCO on a research project. So they planned a customer survey and that is where we jumped in. So it's a win-win situation for both for us as the university because we get access to real world data and um, for OCO because of everything that Simon already pointed out. So we focus our work on research questions that are pressing for evidence building. And at the same time, of course, we also answered questions that are interesting to the private sector. And um, this is all pretty much aligned, which we didn't know upfront because we were not aware of the evidence roadmap in the first place. But um, while doing our research, we came across it and actually it aligns pretty well. So for example, the first um, pillar that uh, Sönke mentioned in the very beginning on um, people and client-focused perspectives, that is naturally very important to the private sector because product development, of course, relates to or potentially relates to higher adoption rates as well and um, increases client value. And that is what we've been focusing on in the last survey. And for uh, the upcoming year, as the cooperation so far has been very successful, we also want to um, prolong the cooperation and we will do an impact assessment so this will be um, then in pillar six, so to say, and aligns perfectly well with the evidence roadmap. So that's all from my side for now, and I'm happy to answer questions later on as well. Great, Thanks. thank you. I mean, maybe while we still we have you, I'll, I'll sort of ask uh, a, a question to the whole panel, but come to you both of you first. Uh, um, so in terms of how effectively you're w working together, public, private. Uh, the role of CSOs, uh, you know, is everything, uh, you know, as you're looking at bringing the evidence together, but also importantly trying to uh, then apply it for uh, impact, um, you know, how's it working and, and what would you, you know, if you could, if there are any recommendations for improving upon that, what would those be? So maybe I'll come to uh, yourself, Simon and Ella. Uh, before turning back to the panel here. Okay, so um, I think what's what's important to understand um, for other companies in the private sector, uh, and that we learned also through this collaboration, is that it's uh, it's important to give, give access to data. Uh, we might think that it's very critical to keep the data confidential, to keep uh, our practices um, a competitive advantage if they were, if they're working, uh, but it's we are in a space that is still trying to find out what are the best practices, how to have the most impact, and there's more to win in sharing and um, yeah, gathering the, uh, the the best practices and uh, good advice um, between different players uh, than to try to protect a competitive advantage. Uh, so I would. I would uh, encourage everyone to yeah, share the results of their, of their research, and uh, especially when it comes to impact, and that can only benefit all the members of uh, the community. Yeah, and besides the data aspect, maybe also um, relating to research questions. So on the one hand, of course, um, needs or yeah, important questions of the cooperative um, of the cooperating partner are important to answer, but at the same time, uh, a data collection 
especially when it's conducted in together with a collaborating partner um, um, always offers the opportunity to ask questions that go beyond the initial um, aspects and using this freedom of answering questions um, that are important for the general public that are important for the um, um, scientific community um, it's, it's always a good opportunity to use it in these um, corporations as well thank you just to get the question clarified, it's about partnerships to address gaps, right? Um, yes, okay. Um, I, I think um, the, the, big, the best big example I would give is the multi-actor partnership project that happened globally in different areas um, where MCI was involved and, um, and other partners, German Watch and Care, um, where civil society had a key role to play, but it builds on that leadership of civil society that would access funding to work with other actors who are donors as well as private sector and governments um, where there is a baseline that is mapped out identifying the key stakeholders in country and then looking at what needs to happen so there is ownership there is the accessibility of finance that's there to conduct these ac um, activities and then potentially follow-ups based on the findings um, it's and looking at the activities that have happened, um, capacity gaps are in almost all of the developing countries. It may be data needs or accessibility to data. It could be the money that's not available to purchase data or purely capacity that's needed to conduct um, evidence generation, which is also sometimes ignored because if evidence is not generated in a methodological manner, the validity of that data collection would not be there. Um, on, in the perspective of Sri Lanka, um, for us as like and trust, uh, we've tried to engage with the government and the processes that are happening uh, would be with that inclusion from the start on. So there would not be an issue of what is coming out being challenged if they are not involved. And this applies to other actors as well. So if it's the interest of private sector, then they need to be in the room when the research or the data collection happens. Um, but we see in a lot of processes where donor funding is accessed, um, the word multi-stakeholders is used for the sake of it. So it's important that this use of multi-stakeholder means there's more than one stakeholder in a room when something happens. So that's, I think, very important, not necessarily from the civil society side, but every other project that happens at small scale or large scale. I would also like to highlight the importance of connecting youth, because I don't think there's a youth representative in the, in the, the, in the panel. So I think there's a um, well, capacity building and gap filling comes with that. You did mention this with university aspect. Um, we need to focus on youth, so identifying the needs of evidence generation amongst youth and education systems where you come from, and then implementing this at local level with the ownership of communities as well as youth from the community um, through training for trainer processes as well as um, processes of certificate courses potentially that could task them to collect data and feed into processes would help uh, scaling up resilience as well as generating means of implementation for actions needed. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to follow up on that because I, I very much agree that, you know, that's where the capacity gaps are. And so the, the, the training and, and the approach we take is not just to, um, through the RAMP program, not just to develop um, semester-long university courses that might be a little bit difficult to access for some of those uh, professionals, but actually training modules that train specifically those things. How do I conduct impact assessments? How do I access funds? How do I you know, understand these problems and do something about them at ministerial level, but also working with the private sector and other actors? And I think that's what, what uh, we're trying to do to fill some of those gaps uh, by having the universities, but also ministerial officials and others take the leadership role in their respective countries in, in doing this. So helping to train them up first, but then through a cascade, they carry on doing this uh, and, uh, and pushing that knowledge and understanding through the network and, and sustain it themselves rather than, rather than through us. Thank you. Thanks, I, w I just wanted to sort of build on the comment about participatory research and kind of who's involved, who's in the room when you're doing it, because I think um, you know, ideally in the research that we did, you know, we would have been able to do that, actually really um, engage some of the stakeholders in, um, you know, 
setting the questions as well for the analysis. And I think you know, in the future, in the design of um, particularly parametric in insurance schemes, but other kinds of disastrous finance, it would be great to have a sort of participatory research component in there, in the design, so you can actually look with um, donors and the financial institutions and um, the private sector and um, you know the beneficiaries you can look at um, these you know the incentives um, and the d in the design of um, the new product um, you know at the start and you know having all of those stakeholders together when thinking about you know how is this going to work is it going to achieve the intended outcomes you know what what do from different stakeholder perspectives what how you know what would work, I think, um, you know, would be really, really beneficial. So and we're hoping to be able to do something like that for a new CRIF product in the um, Caribbean for water utilities companies um, to actually work more closely with the Inter-American Development Bank uh, and CRIF um, and um, the country governments to, you know, really um, look at some of these questions in the design phase. So, yeah, more of that kind of research, I think, would be great. Great, that's really interesting. So, on to you. Yeah, so um, I would also generally agree on, on the views of the previous speaker and also underline that um, from the perspective as a federal research institute doing under evaluations that the entire evaluative process for generating, synthesizing and uptaking evidence are, um, at the end of the day um, needs to have a participatory elements. Um, so we have a specific model we apply therefore and um, also underlie the um, call for um, for um, joining forces with for the evidence initiatives. Yeah. So shall I? Everyone? Um, yeah, good. Um, I just want to say thank you. Um, I hope you could already see uh, some themes coming out and also um, actors actively taking up uh, individual bits and pieces of the evidence roadmap. Um, me and the function as, as, as leading the impact working group of Intro Resilience, I also want to say um, what's coming next um, because this is only what happened la uh, between um, last year's COP and, and this year's COP. Um, and we actually have a very active exchange in the group. So there are like um, 30, 40 people uh, convening about every two months. We are discussing um, some of these uh, research topics. We also discuss when, for example, and this is actually a very uh, encouraging developing development that um, 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 science donors are coming forward, that there are actually opportunities um, for these type of, of questions to be answered. We are coordinating on that. Um, and then lastly, we are also um, gathering in this format and uh, in, in, in other formats to actually exchange on progress and, and, and what's happening. So I want to conclude with an appeal uh, for people um, to join the conversations, um, to make this also a, a, a lively debate, um, and also stay tuned, um, because I think this is only the start, and as uh, more and more updates and announcements are coming in, um, also at this COP, um, this is a growing space, um, and I think we have the uh, joint duty um, to also uh, make sure that um, the evidence is there um, to support these programs. Thank you. So I think, uh, you know, what to me has been really clear is that this process is already very participatory and has all good rep representation, but it needs to be much more so and particularly uh, not only at the uh, evaluation stage where it is obviously important but also very early on in the design stage as well but clearly very valuable research um, i did want to ask one more question about how you think this could also help uh, influence this process uh, underway here but i think uh, Vasito actually provided a very very good insight into that already or uh, as a negotiator on loss and damage here um, so i think you know uh, I think we should thank the panel, but also um, not just for the presentation, but all, for all the work you're doing, because clearly it's such a critical and urgent agenda that uh, particularly the most vulnerable countries and communities are now uh, facing. Thank you.